It's a great privilege today to have uh, Dr. Sarah Williams with us to our Theology Day, our Gather Movement Theology Day called I See a New City. Um, we've asked Sarah to tell us about what we can learn from our brothers and sisters in history and that could help us in our mission to see our cities and towns uh, transformed by the kingdom. Sarah, you've, um, you've suggested identifying three examples in church history where perhaps we, you know, we have much to learn from and um, perhaps you can explain further. Yeah, really, it, it, there's so much treasure in our tradition. And all I want to do in this little short period of time is to introduce some fresh dialogue partners into this day of thinking about God's work in the world, particularly in cities. And one of the things that's notable in church history is how many times you get people named after cities. Catherine of Siena, Bridget of Kildare, Augustine of Hippo, um, Salvian of Marseille. There are so many figures who are saints of the church, the great heroines and heroes of the faith, but they're actually named after cities. And it's this relationship between place and the embodying of faith in a locality that's really interesting. And I want to introduce you to one of those people who was named after a city, and that's Basil of Caesarea. And we have to go back to the fourth century to just get a sense of Basil's life. He's an interesting figure, deeply engaged with the city of Caesarea. He's a local boy. Not always easy to mobilise change in the place you come from. But Basil lives in Caesarea. His father, all of his family are really the elites of this Cappadocian city. Caesarea is in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. And it was an extraordinarily powerful city in the fourth century because it was one of the great gateways of trade and movement of people and ideas between the East and the West. It's strategic, a bit like Monday Hong Kong, for example. And Basil spent his life trying to avoid being involved in anything other than prayer. And yet, because he had an extraordinary skill set, he was drawn into the life of the city in a, in a very, very powerful way. Caesarea was locked in doctrinal debate, particularly with the Gnostics. And what Basil does, his great contribution arises because he spent time dangerously reading the Gospels. And he starts to ask himself, who is this foot-washing God? And the problem with Gnosticism was its great hatred of the body. This idea that matter itself was intrinsically evil and that spiritual life was about detaching oneself from materiality and somehow removing oneself. And Basil saw that monasticism, as it was developing in Caesarea, was becoming increasingly world-rejecting, body-rejecting, materiality-rejecting. And how do you correct poor theology? And Basil's great contribution was to live good theology. And this notion of foot washing started to change the way he understood how to engage in Caesarea. He became the bishop. And during his time as bishop of Caesarea, he was involved in reconciling disputes between members of the elite, bringing in the rule of law so that the elites of the city would also be subject to the law instead of arbitrarily wielding it. But most of all, teaching the young monastics who were dominating the city with their doctrinal disputes how to practice the foot washing God way with the people in the city. He introduced all sorts of extraordinary creative engagements to help relieve the poor in times of famine. And actually, when we look back on Basil, there's lots more to say about him. He's a good person to read about. But when we look back on Basil, he contributed to the life of monasticism, the central importance of integrating a life of prayer with engaging with a place in practical works of service, whether that's the law, whether that's in institutions. And many in the Western monastic tradition see Basil really as the great architect of what would become the great medieval hospitals.
And most of the hospitals that we have, for example, in the UK, are actually derived originally out of monastic foundations such as St Thomas's Hospital in London. They were originally hospitals, places of hospitality, entertainment of the stranger and the care of the sick. And we look back to Basil of Caesarea for that. But let me take you to the 17th century and the wake of the Thirty Years' War, which devastated the city-states of Germany. Arguably, that Thirty Years' War was among the most terrible conflicts that Europe has ever seen. It was a civil war that divided families as well as cities, as well as countries. And right at the centre of the Thirty Years' War was a dispute over doctrine itself. And the effects of this war were to decimate the cities of Germany, the city-states that formed the region that we now know as Germany. Those states were flattened, they were raised to the ground, the infrastructures, education, the institutions for poor relief. They were in, they were in a state of deep degradation after this prolonged and terrible conflict. And right in the midst of this, in the womb of the Lutheran church, comes an extraordinary movement of revitalization of the people of God, centered around leaders, as often movements of renewal are, but encompassing a whole community that wanted to ask again, in an age when the church had become arid and dry and locked in doctrinal formalism, arguing over all of the different variants of Reformation teaching, skeptical, really skeptical about works-based righteousness. If you are justified by faith alone, then do you actually need to do anything in the world? And surely doing things in the world might smack of this works-based righteousness, which is in this sense, horribly Catholic. And what comes out of this movement of renewal around leaders like Johann Arndt and August Franke is this centrality, this re-centering on what it means to love Jesus. A revitalization of the heart that sought to integrate the theology of the mind with the passion on love of Christ. But of course, the pietists, as they became known, they have a question. And that is, if we focus on the regeneration of the heart, what does that mean for God's mission in the world? And what came out of pietism was a vision for the creation of a new city. If you've got decimated cities, cities that have been raised to the ground, then in one sense, the only way you can move forward is to create some new cities. And in the 1690s, these, this community of people revitalized by a new sense of the living presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, of intimate personal faith with him, they began to build a place, Halle. And it started as a learning center to teach young people what it means to know Christ. And Halle started out as this place of nurturing biblical studies. But, and I want to get this right, so I'm even going to look at my, my little notes here. You can't nurture biblical studies without actually doing something. So as Halle grew, you've got not only students who are there in order to study the scripture primarily, but they're living with house masters and mistresses. They're living with labourers and they begin to build Halle. And all the theological students who formed the core of this new city were also required to engage in multiple different tasks as part of their learning of what it means to follow Christ. They set up a school for the poor, an orphanage, which in fact became the model of institutional for, uh, orphanages globally. They set up schools for the elite, what became the German gymnasiums, the great model of European education in the 18th century. They created a chemistry lab, a bookstore, a printing press for the uh, printing and distribution of Bibles in the vernacular language. They set up a home for widows. They set up a laundry, a farm 
and finally, but not least, a brewery. And they created a place, a city, diverse in its expressions of meeting the needs of human beings, both the economic needs of humans and the, ultra, and the entrepreneurial needs of human beings, as well as the spiritual life founded in scripture. And Halle became this extraordinary place of sending missionaries in groups, communities, communities of families who'd been taught how to farm, who'd been taught how, how to develop artisan trades, went. They went to the Caribbean. They went to India. They went to Latin America. They went to parts of North America. They populated the Pennsylvania area, North Carolina, and they built cities. They created hubs of wealth generation, integrated with a strong emphasis on personal, intimate relationship with Christ expressed in all of life. And the char why have we heard so little about them? And in a sense, we've heard so little about them because they had this most glorious capacity to disappear. Because the first thing the pietists did was to create networks of fellowship with other people who love the Lord Jesus Christ. Fellowship across nations, across boundaries, across territories, across ecclesial traditions equals transformation. And these pietists were the architects of that. And historians look back on this movement that came out of Halle as really setting the foundations for what in the 18th century would be the great movements of the evangelical revival. And there's a, I need to stop talking about them and tell you about a third example, because I could talk about the, the pietists till the cows come home. But let me take you to 19th century Liverpool and to an individual again. Basil was an individual with a vision, but I want to take you to a wife in the late 1860s, a woman who had just been through the most terrible trauma. She had four children, the youngest of whom, her only girl, had fallen over the banisters onto a tiled floor below and taken six hours to die in agony while her parents, George and Josephine Butler, held their daughter um, desperate. And that accident took place in the city of Cheltenham. And in order to escape the scene of that accident, George and Josephine moved to Liverpool, where George became the headmaster of a new school for the trading elites of the city of Liverpool. But Josephine was alone in their house as they had moved to this new place, overcome by grief as she wrestled, almost went through a kind of baptism of deep sorrow. She was already a woman of faith. But during this period of intense grieving for her daughter, she laid hold of God in a new and extraordinary way. And she felt God beginning to reorientate her own personal grief into being aware of the grief of those around her. And Liverpool was a city of grief, a city still shaped, even after the emancipation of slaves, by the 18th century and early 19th century slave trade. Many of the great slaving vessels that went out to, to do their triangle around the globe, carrying slaves, left from Liverpool. And that culture of slavery still shaped the city. I think it's terribly important that we know the history of our places. As we take spiritual responsibility for our place, knowing its history is incredibly important. And this legacy of slavery still shaped the city of Liverpool in the late 1860s when Butler went, to, Josephine went to live there notably amongst the women. It was a city really, really rooted, as it were, in the great port trade of prostitution. 
And as the great industrial waves were reshaping the landscape of modern Britain, Liverpool as an industrial city was receiving people in from rural areas into the anonymity of the city. And that included young, young women, many of who came into work as domestic servants, but found themselves one way or another on the streets of Liverpool. Josephine began to go out into the streets and see the pain around her. She got in touch with her cousin, Charles Birrell, who was a Baptist minister, and began to say to him, what can I do to connect with the suffering in this city? And he sent her to the center of suffering, which was the great Brownlow workhouse in the middle of Liverpool, 4,000 of the most impoverished people of the city found their way into that workhouse. And Butler started visiting. She went to the cellar of the Brownlow workhouse, which was right under this huge building. And in the cellar, women, most of them engaged in penny prostitution, were used to separate the fibers in old rope, rope to be used as caulking in the ships. And she writes, I went down to the cellar and begged admission, which is an extraordinary phrase from this middle class woman from an elite and privileged background, begging admission. And she started to go in to the Brownlow workhouse and sit on the floor of this cold cellar with the women splitting these fibres. And while they worked, she made friends with the women. Now, there's nothing unusual about middle-class women being engaged with the poor in 19th century philanthropic London, but what is unusual is to make friends and not stop visiting the same group of people. And for two years, Josephine got to know these women, began to pray with them, began to read scripture with them. On one of her visits to the Brownlow workhouse, Josephine was walking through the workhouse and she saw a woman lying in the corner, her hair was matted and her eyes were wild. And she walked over to this young woman and she did the most simple thing. She simply pushed her hair back from her face. Mary, this young woman, looked back on that moment when Josephine Butler pushed her hair from her sweating forehead. It's one of the most significant turning points in her life. What Josephine didn't know was Mary's backstory. At the age of 15, she had come in from Matlock in Derbyshire into, into Liverpool to work as a domestic servant. The master of her house on one fateful day asked her to go upstairs to collect his cigar case for her. He followed her up there, locked the door and raped her. Mary became pregnant. She was thrown out of her domestic situation onto the streets of Liverpool. Her child died and she was drawn into a brothel. She worked in that brothel for four years of her life until she developed such bad consumption that her hacking cough started to dis disturb other clients and the brothel keeper threw her back out onto the streets of Liverpool. She was extremely ill by then and she crawled all the way through to the Brownlow workhouse where she tried to kill herself with rat poison. And it was the days immediately following that that Josephine Butler found her curled up in the corner. Josephine said to Mary, I once had a daughter, come home with me and let me care for you. And she took her back to her own home and for three months Mary was cared by, for by George and Josephine in their own home. She died of consumption, but not before she had found her own living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Famously, she said to George, who tried to tell her about Jesus once, oh, I know about him. I've seen him. You welcomed me into your home and treated me as a daughter. I have seen Jesus. And in those three months, as, as Mary learned to pray with Josephine, Josephine described it as an avalanche of women. And all Mary's old friends on the street began to come to the house at all hours, hardened women, many of them brothel keepers themselves, who'd been involved in prostitution for many years, asking for prayer. Sometimes Josephine was knocked up in the middle of the night by calls for women who were dying on the streets for her to go and pray with them and pray with the dying. 
she was overwhelmed by these women. And in the wake of Mary's death, she began to see the need to create a home, a place where women could come and be safe and begin to transition out of the life of prostitution, the easiest life to get into and the hardest life to get out of. Women who had no way back into respectable society and women who had largely no skills, little education and no way of earning a living for themselves aside from the sex trade, caught in that, in that way of life. And Josephine set up a home. Now to set up a home is no small thing. She needed the resources to do that. And as she began to pray for these women at the same time, she began to pray with other women from all across different uh, religious traditions, different denominational backgrounds across the city of Liverpool, began to pray together for these women, to raise funds together for setting up this house that became known as a house of rest. And within that house of rest, there was a rhythm of prayer, but they also set up a little envelope factory. And the women were involved in creating a trade, making money so that they could be self-supporting. And from that house of rest, that envelope factory began to go on to create further networks amongst industrialists in Liverpool who would supply the raw materials, but also buy on the products that were being made by these women. And as those industrialists get involved, so do they become involved in communities of practice centered on prayer. And many of those prayerful community of practices not only involved um, Christians in the city, but new Christians who are coming out of these extraordinarily marginalized backgrounds. And these communities of practice began to reflect a new kind of social and economic composition that literally cross-class divides. And within these networks of prayer, those who were on the margins of the culture were found employment. They, were, they began to be legally represented by others in these communities of practice. They wrote letters to one another into, into uh, among other praying communities across the country, writing letters to put young women into alternative forms of employment, taking women in who nobody wanted to take into domestic service because they had had such a compromised background. And this movement began, a movement of prayer and relationship, fellowship across the boundaries, rooted in prayer equals transformation. And as historians look back on what was birthed in the city of Liverpool, this extraordinary movement that brought together the spiritual and the economic well-being of humans, <laughs> they see those networks as forming the backbone that became the women's movement, leading to the alterations in the fundamental constitutional and legal rights of women in Britain, that then went on to influence movements in Australia, in North America, in New Zealand, in other parts of the globe. So I wanted to give you that story because it's the story of an individual in great pain and sorrow. And so much can come out of such extraordinarily small beginnings when the imagination of the people of God is not hindered by the existing structures and forms but begin to dream and imagine how things might be. Great. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much. That was really, really helpful and insightful. Um, it, it begs a load of questions. Um, and uh, 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 thank you for just bringing to, to mind those uh, just fantastic examples. Um, I, I think I particularly wanted you to reflect on this, this um, link between uh, social transformation um, spiritual transformation and prayer, because you mentioned it particularly in a couple of the incidences where where these were praying communities. You know, they, they weren't they weren't simply a bunch of people doing social justice. Um, there was something else happening here. Um, do you have any comments on that? For Josephine Butler, prayer had a very particular meaning. Prayer was about aligning the present with what will be in the future. 
To pray was to practice in the present what we hope for in the future. So her referent point was God's city that will come where God will dwell in all his fullness. Every tear will be wiped away and there will be healing, healing of bodies, healing of relationships, healing of interactions, healing of all the wealth creating confusion of the present. And so it's that vision that roots prayer. And to pray for her was to scoop up that future and bring it into the present as Butler's phrase, a holy revolution upon the earth. And so the now and the not yet fuse in prayer. And that prayer is how we apprehend what God has promised now and in the future. And so praying wasn't something that you do as a prelude to action. It was action. It was the primary action. And it wasn't simply a pious action. It was a social action. It was an economic action. It was a political action because it was seeing what God would do in all of reality and imitating him as he works in the world. And the idea that you can somehow pray and separate action in service of other human beings was an alien concept for Josephine Butler. And she writes on prayer and her understanding of prayer is right at the heart of what animates her fostering and nurturing of these communities of practice. The greatest legacy, legacy of those pietists that I told you about in Halle was the setting up on the lands of Count von Zinzendorf, a hundred year watch of prayer. The Moravian brethren, vitalized by pietism, refugees, limited in what they could do, but the one thing they were not limited in is prayer. And they created that extraordinary 100-year prayer watch at Hernhut, round the clock, that was the backdrop to the century of what is considered the greatest missional movement in the last thousand years of the church. Prayer is not separate. Prayer is at the very, very heart of what we do. That's great. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, yeah, my, my second question, Sarah, is, is really to do with this vision for the new city. Um, what, what you seem to be bringing out from these examples is that this, this is a very different feel to setting up Christendom, um, where, you know, we're all in charge and uh, everyone has got to be a Christian and uh, you've got to do it our way and so on. Could you just reflect on that? Because um, I think when people feel about the creation of the, the, the transformed city, there, there's some, uh, some sense really of confusion really as to what that is, what we're actually looking for. Well, the, the models of Christian engagement with cities in the past are diverse. So even in the three examples that we've looked at, you've got Basel bringing transformation in an established city context where he was the local boy. But then you've got in Halle, in a sense, the redesigning through entrepreneurialism of new urban spaces. And then in Josephine, you've got reform within a city that had become broken. And these are all models or examples of different ways in which the church at different moments in time has engaged with the city. And sometimes as the people of God, we're called to be creative designers of new things. Other times we're called to be restorers of broken walls to fix the drainage systems in our cities. Other times we're called to engage in the institutional legal structures as those who are able to rethink how to integrate Christian faith and the structures and ideologies of the city. These are all part of our DNA as the people of God through time. And that's why prayer is so central because there's no one paradigm. 
Calvin set up Geneva as a city which was essentially a theocracy. He did that prayerfully, but it's not a model that easily transposes into other places. And so as we are in place, full of the Spirit of God, we have to ask God what he's doing in the city because he's there and he's already at work. What we get to do is participate with him. And that process of discerning in prayer, listening to the past, understanding the history of the city, listening to what the Spirit of God is saying to the city in the present, rooting that in Scripture so that the vital Rema word of the Lord is in our fiber as we engage missionally. That is incredibly important because if history teaches us one thing, that is that there are really no blueprints here. We get to follow the living God who moves, who's active, who's constantly and creatively involved in this participatory relationship with humanity in the church and beyond the church. Thank you. That, that's really helpful. That, that uh, um, yeah, that, that sense of uh, that there's no one, there's no one way to do this. I think it's wonderful. And also that God is, you know, intimately involved in this. So it's his, it's his mission. So um, that's wonderful. The, the last question I have for you really is, is you mentioned it two or three times is, is, is the link between unity and, and the transformation of a place. And you talked around uh, Josephine, I think, involving other women in the context. You talked around um, a number of people involved in Hala um, and, uh, and that sense really that this, this isn't for the, you know, the, the Christian Superman this, or, or woman. This is a, this somehow, there's something about unity in this as well. Perhaps you could reflect on that. Um, I think, you know, as I was thinking about today, th this is a phrase I, I, I wrote down and I, 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 I want to get it right. It's, it's a distillation of what I see in each of these case studies. Fellowship across the boundaries of institutional, national, territorial settings and ecclesial traditions based on common relationship with Christ equals transformation. That boundary breaking where intimate, personal, immediate relationship with Jesus Christ becomes this source of extraordinary diverse fellowship. That transforms cultures, that transforms nations, that transforms cities and places. Um, and I, we see that with the model with Josephine Butler. We see that at Halle and the way in which pietist mission was embodied and indigenized um, a, a, across the nations. Um, there's an extraordinary painting that epitomizes that. It was painted in the 1720s by a Moravian pietist painter in Pennsylvania. It's in the Moravian archive in Pennsylvania. And it's, it's an extraordinary painting of 21 people gathered around Jesus, throne in heaven. And it's called First Fruits. And it's a picture of the first 21 uh, Moravian missionaries who were sent out, who died on the mission field. What's amazing about this picture is that when you look at those 21 eclectic folk gathered around Jesus, they're not wearing the common white robes of heaven. By common, I mean everybody the same. They're all wearing their different local dress, the dress of their different traditions. They're wearing their different headdresses and they're carrying different tools of their trade. And they're all standing there, this hodgepodge mix of people gathered around the Lord Jesus. It's an incredibly prophetic image of what it means to be on mission with God, to be on mission with God is to be on mission with people who are not necessarily like us, with our brothers and sisters from all sorts of backgrounds. And that common rootedness as we gather around Christ can do all sorts of uh, holy revolution on the earth. <laughs> That's wonderful, Sarah.
Um, can, can I have just finish with the last question? <laughs> this is the very last. <laughs> I could go on all day. Um, Sarah, as, as as people are engaged in this um, mission um, in this country and around the world to see the transformation of their cities, is there is there anything from history that that um, gives us uh, dangers to avoid? You know, things that we really shouldn't do. Um, uh, I suppose we don't really want to reinvent the wheel. Um, so, are there things that you think? Do you know uh, th these th these are the observations I have from around history? Um, and uh, it'd be good to avoid these. For me, the main thing is the danger of the loss of the first love for Christ, where we move from intimate union with him and one another into thinking we actually have got it sussed, where we begin to rely on our own strength, our own wisdom, our own insight, our own practices, our own organisations, our own institutions and our own structures. And we start to call those Christian rather than the re integral relationship of life, vital life, that comes from our rootedness in the vine. And in a way, the history of Christianity is a tragic history as well as a glorious one. It's the story of people coming and going, coming close and moving away, falling in love and then growing cold. And this movement, this ebb and flow, things that start out vital, take their eyes just two degrees off the face of Jesus and they end up angry. They end up full of self-effort. They're full of factions and tensions. And it's a frustrating comment to make, but there's nothing like the living presence of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's the primary lesson from history, is this deep dependence and humility that needs to be at the very centre of our dependence on, on the Lord Jesus Christ for what we do. So we have to be aware of ourselves and of our pride and of our ability to shift just a few degrees from reliance on the Holy Spirit to reliance on ourselves. And the other thing I would say is the real danger of ghettoism, of the removal of the people of God into a safe space where they are untainted with the mucky reality of the city, of the communities of which we're a part. And even uh, for Josephine Butler wrote about the dangers of religious revival. She wanted revival. We need revival, but she feared it as well because so often the church siphoned revival into itself, into the uplifting of the internal ghetto of the church rather than seeing revival as something which changes crime rates in a city, which alters the way in which those women are able to feed their children the alcohol habits of husbands. That's what revival's about. It's much bigger than that internal life of the church. And our ghettoizing, our separating of ourselves off, is a real danger. And it happens again, over and over again in the life of the church, that we want to hold ourselves safe rather than engage in the foot washing God work in the world. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank God you. bless you. Thank you.